and recognize that yesterday was Veterans Day. And that's a big deal, um, not only for our country, but for our church. And so we want to pause and take time to honor the folks who are in our midst who have served uh, in the military. So I'm, here's what I'm going to ask is if, if you're a veteran or even if uh, you're a, a family um, member is a veteran and has served, would you please stand just right where you are? All the veterans in the room, I know you're out there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And, um, yeah, let me just say this. You can, have, you can grab a seat, but let me say one more thing. I don't think our culture does a great job with honoring people. And you deserve honor for what you have done and the way that you have served. And every time that we gather on a Sunday morning with the freedom to worship, it's because of what you've done. And we are deeply grateful, and we want to honor you um, here, and we're thankful for you being here this morning. So thanks um, to all of you who served. Yeah, you can clap again. As Kevin said, we are in week two of a message series that we've entitled Counterculture. And if you weren't here last week, I can catch you up really quickly. It's answering one question. All of the messages in this series are going to be answering this question. What does it mean to live a godly life in the midst of an ungodly culture? And, and that's what we're talking about. And I said last week that there's not much debate about the ungodly part. Hardly anybody says, no, you know what? I think our world is moving steadily in a more godly way. Um, hardly ever. But on the other side, there's a lot of debate about, well then, how then should we live? How, what is our response to living in a world, in a culture like that? And so what we decided to do over these four weeks is take a look at the biblical model. What, what's the What's the mandate that God's given his people for how to live in just such a culture? And so if you were here last week, we started looking at a guy named Daniel and his life. Daniel lived about 600 years before Jesus showed up on the scene. Uh, his life is chronicled in a book called Daniel in the Old Testament. And what we saw was an amazing picture of how Daniel lived in a ridiculously ungodly culture. Uh, Babylon was the, the place that he lived. It was led by this evil king, Nebuchadnezzar. And, and the place was uh, just heading in the opposite direction of God from the very beginning. Um, they, they changed Daniel's name. This will give you some idea. For his name meant God is my judge. They, they changed his name to Satan's prince. So we're just going to take you nice, uh, upstanding, God-fearing boy and call you um, Satan's prince. Is that okay? That's an idea of the kind of godlessness that he faced. And yet, he lived in that culture for his entire life, for 70 years. He got there when he was 16 years old. And not only did he remain devoted to God throughout the process, but he actually impacted the culture. He actually, we're going to read here in a minute, that that evil king ends up praising God. That the culture itself turns and looks to Daniel's God. And how did he do that? that? That's what the question we started with last week. How would someone have that much of an impact in that ungodly of a culture? Well, two things we saw last week. One was humility. And that, that might not be the first thing that pops into your head about what's necessary to impact an ungodly culture. But it is absolutely necessary. And, and Daniel exemplified that. He understood that everything, everything he had was by the grace of God. And so he had this platform of humility, which impacts the ungodly culture. Here's why. Because the root of the problem of ungodliness is the refusal to let God be God, right? That's ungodly. And so that's pride. That comes from a, a prideful foundation. And so if you try to impact pride with more pride... It doesn't work. It doesn't help anything. In fact, it makes the, the situation worse. And, and my fear is that far too often, well-meaning, God-honoring people have tried to influence ungodly culture with a prideful stance. Whether it was a judgmental spirit or a condemning nature, it was a prideful foundation. And so they brought pride against pride, and you know how that works. Not very well. <laughs> 
And what Daniel showed us was if you start with a foundation of humility, you can really make an impact. That was number one. Number two was Daniel had hope. He had hope that came from the sovereignty of God. And that gave him confidence and courage for the long haul. He was sure that God was in control of who was in control. Even when it was this evil king, Daniel assumed that God was in control. I told a story about Maryland basketball at the end last week. And I said, I watched a game knowing the final score. And it changed the way I watched the whole game, right? And whether the home team is winning at the present moment or not, God has given us the final score. And the home team wins. And so that should affect, that should give us such great hope and courage no matter what the current score is. Maybe I'll say it a different way. That... um, That pessimism and fear make no sense when victory is guaranteed. It just doesn't make any sense, right? So uh, um, let me get really practical here. What does that mean for us? It means stop all the doom and gloom already, okay? Because the way to impact an ungodly culture is to have hope and courage based on the sovereignty of God. What does that look like? Um, How many of you remember Y2K? Right? Some of you weren't born yet. I get it. But for the rest of us who were around, you remember that whole thing? And this great, this was going to be the mother of all computer glitches. Remember that? And people were predicting that it was going to, elevators were going to get stuck between floors and airplanes were going to crash and nuclear plants were going to melt down and banks were going to shut down. It was going to be, you know, this horrible, horrible thing. You remember that? Uh, We were living in um, Fairfax, Virginia at the time, and there are a lot of people connected with D.C. who lived there. And I actually, this is no joke, I had some friends who they were convinced this was President Clinton's doing. And that he had devised this whole plan so that uh, there would be turmoil and he could make himself president forever. And I'm, I'm serious, this is what they thought. And you could not talk them out of it. They were, they were so sure, and people were stocking up, and there was this whole thing. You remember that? What happened? Nothing. Nothing, <laughs> nothing happened. Well, actually, not exactly nothing. I found out in doing some research that the one glitch that's been verified is about 150 slot machines in the state of Delaware went haywire. <laughs> Which, you're like, okay, but I didn't need to prepare for that. You know what I did? I took my family to Disney World. On January 1st, 2000, I figured, well, if it goes crazy, we'll be in the Magic Kingdom. So, you know, how, <laughs> how bad can it be? Right? And um, why am I telling you that? Here's why. Because people were just freaking out. And, and so my fear is that often when I talk to other Christ followers, whenever there's a law that either gets passed or doesn't get passed, or there's an official who gets elected or who doesn't get elected, depending on you know, what you thought should happen. People act like the sky is falling. Like, like this is you know, the worst thing that's ever happened in the, in the state of the world. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that political and, and legal um, matters, aren't, issues aren't important. I'm not saying that. And I'm not even saying that it's not sad when ungodly people gain power or when um, biblical values are, are, are thrown out. I'm not saying that's not a sad day for our country. What I'm saying is you don't need to freak out about it. You, you should respond with a hope that comes from the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of who's in control. And sometimes we don't act like that. And so that's a a challenge to do that. So what do we need? If we're going to live godly lives in an ungodly culture, here's what you need. First, you need humility that comes from the grace of God. Everything, everything is a gift from God. And second, you need hope that comes from understanding the sovereignty of God. And we're going to find one more thing this morning. So we're going to go back to Daniel. And uh, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to another king. And the way that his interaction with Daniel teaches us some things. But first, let me read you the last verse of chapter 4, where we were last week. Because this really describes the transformation of this king, this evil king. And and these are his own words. Verse 37, listen. Now, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven. 
because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Can you imagine that? Here's what that means before we turn the page. is You will never meet anyone who is more unlikely than Nebuchadnezzar to glorify and praise God. And that there he is. His life was a complete 180, completely transformed. Through Daniel, the power of God transformed his life. And so that should be challenging to you. There's no one. You think of the most unlikely, ungodly person. Uh, They're not worse than Nebuchadnezzar. God may have you in a position to influence a life. Which one is out of bounds? Which one is too far? None. That should be challenging for us. All right, we're going to turn the page. And when we turn the page, we're going to meet a new king in chapter 5. He's actually three kings down the line from Nebuchadnezzar. And when we turn the page, we're going to see a couple of things. One, we're going to see a party thrown by the king. Then we're going to see a message given by God. And at the end, we're going to fast forward to the method that Jesus gives for the church based on those two things. So I want to show you a party, a message, and a method. All right, let's turn the page. Chapter one or chapter five, verse one. First, the party. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and all his nobles and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that they had taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Let's pause there for a second. There's the party thrown by the king. And the reason I think we need to stop and look at it is because this party is exemplary of what happens every time people in a culture, are not able to find meaning and purpose from what the culture has to offer. I'll say it again. Every time, no matter when in history or where in the world you look, when people are unable to find meaning and purpose in what the culture has to offer, they do the same thing. They throw a party. Now, maybe they don't actually physically throw a party, but they turn to what this party exemplifies. The ingredients are all here for people who try to manufacture their own meaning and purpose or distract themselves from the lack of it. And that's what happens every single time in every culture in the world, doesn't matter where it is or when it is. When people are faced with the lack of meaning and purpose, they either create their own, they manufacture it, or They distract themselves from the lack of it. And they use the same things to do it every time. And they're all in this passage, in the four verses I read. Did you see it? The first one is sex. Sex and pleasure. If you can't find meaning and purpose, turn to that. And so you see this guest list includes the king's wives and his concubines, which I'm not sure that's a good idea. To have those, those, I'm not sure that's a glitch in the invitation system or what happened there. But what you can infer there, and a lot of the commentators say, this is, that's not normal. Um, to mix those groups and the nobles along with them. That this was just a blowout, um, you know, um, X-rated event. And I wanted to show you, this is 2,600 years ago. <laughs> Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. People in search of meaning and purpose turn to the same things. And the first one, the first ingredient here is sex and pleasure. The second is money and possessions and power, right? Same as today. They they bring out the gold and the silver. Who's there? The nobles are there. What are are the nobles? The, The nobles are the people who know that they're better than the other people who didn't get invited to the party. And they all gather around and they go, aren't we great? We got an invitation. It, it, exactly the same as every culture in history. In view of a lack of meaning and purpose, we turn to sex and pleasure and money and possession and power. And then the last one, the last ingredient, is religion 
And don't you know, when you run through all of the other ones and it doesn't work, then what does everybody do? <laughs> they turn to religion. And, and you can see this, but they, they did religion in the way that most people do it. They try to um, call upon the gods. They try to say, well, what do the gods require of us? Let's try to do that because maybe then it will get better for us. Every culture. In, in view of a lack of meaning and purpose, do the same thing. Follow the same pattern. And there they are. Kings throwing a party. And the question is, well, then how would a God-devoted person respond to the party? And the typical answer is what? Stop it. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> God is good. You're bad. So stop it. <laughs> how does that work? In case you're wondering. <laughs> that doesn't work. It doesn't provide any transformation. Why? Because it doesn't deal with the source of the issue. See, the problem is not, and you'll see this as we finish up today, that the things that I just read of sex and pleasure and possessions and religion, none of those things are bad. They're just out of place in the way that the culture is using them. And so... You're bad, stop it, doesn't deal with replacing where am I going to get meaning and purpose in life. And, and it'd be like this. It'd be like if I had uh, conjunctivitis, uh, pink eye, and you said, stop rubbing your eye. Okay. Does that solve my problem? It might be a good, it might be wise counsel. And to stop using possessions or to stop using power or to stop using sex in that way, that might be good advice. But it's not the problem. It doesn't deal with the source of the issue. I've got an infection. And I can stop rubbing all I want. And it's not going to help if I don't get, the, the, if, it, if the source of the problem is not addressed. The source of the problem is people are disconnected. Um, Augustine, St. Augustine famously said one time, we all have a God-shaped void in our lives. The same could be said of a culture. Every culture, minus God at the center of it, will search for something else, anything else, to provide meaning and purpose. And it, it will never, never work. And so, don't miss this. What's our job? Our role as people who represent God is not to condemn the culture nor to adopt the culture but to redeem the culture. I'm going to get to that. What does that mean? I'm glad you asked. Let's uh, turn the page. Uh, so we, we've seen the party and what it represents and now I want to show you a message from God because God's not asleep at the switch folks. He, he's not unaware of the hearts of every human being. And so God's aware of this. God sends a message. And if you've ever heard the phrase, the writing on the wall, this is where it came from. Maybe you didn't know that. It's biblical. In the next two verses, I'll read to you where, where it happens. So in the midst of this party, God sends a message. And this is how he does it. Verse 5. Suddenly, fingers of a human hand appeared. That's weird. And wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched as the hand watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened his legs began weak, became weak, and his knees were knocking. I'm not sure if that's the first place that knee knocking was thought of either. But there it is. Can you imagine this? You're in this blowout rave party, and all of a sudden a hand shows up. And you're thinking, I drank something wrong <laughs> at this point. And I don't know, uh, I've always, I don't know whether it was like a regular size hand or whether, it, I've always pictured it being like a really big hand. I'm not sure why. And the hand starts writing on the wall. And this message freaks them out. Now, I think it's so interesting. The king, we're going to sing in a, in a minute, has no idea what the message says. <laughs> he can't interpret it. A a but he is afraid of what it says. I think this is so emblematic of a, a culture that has gone off the rails. 
I, like it, there's usually an agreement that things are not going in a good direction. <laughs> but nobody knows, they can't agree on how to fix it. N nobody can understand what the real root of the problem is. So you try this and you try this and you try this. I'm telling you 20 years ago, 40 years ago for sure, there was this great movement that we're going to solve all of the world's problems by technology. That we will not need religion anymore because we're going to figure it out. We're that smart. How'd that go? Yeah. And, and, but it's just symptomatic of, of the problem. Th that uh, this idea that we understand that there's a problem, but I can't interpret it. So what do you do? You call the God guy. <laughs> and Daniel's brought in to read the words from God, to read the message from God. I, I want to read you exactly what he says. Um, and, and in it, he gives a, sort of a backstory before interpreting the writing on the wall. This is the way it happens. And starting in verse 18, Daniel says, Your Majesty, the Most High God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position that God gave him, all the nations and peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. What's he saying? God's in control of who's in control. Verse 20. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like an ox. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. There's the backstory to the conversion of Nebuchadnezzar. God prompted. Verse 22. But you, Belshazzar his son, have not humbled yourself. Though you knew all of this, instead you've set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You, you have the, had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor God, who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parsin. Here's what it means. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Well, I'm not sure if Belshazzar hears that and thinks he can turn over a new leaf at this point. But it says, Then Belshazzar commands that Daniel was be clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Too late. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So, God sends a message. What's the message? The message is, you've been weighed on a scale and found one thing. What's the scale? See, the scale here represents two things. It represents truth and justice. Now, what does a scale do? A scale tells you the truth. Don't you hate that? <laughs> right? I mean, you sort of want to know the truth, but you sort of don't want to know the truth, right? Um, I know the Bible says the truth will set you free, but, you know, there's also the thing that says um, you can't handle the truth. And sometimes I'm like right in the middle of that thing, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and so I, I had this scale that we had in our bathroom. It must have been 40 years old. It was one of those ones with the line and the little dial that went around with the numbers on it that were sort of faded after all the years. And so it wasn't super accurate, and I loved it. <laughs> I figured out this way that I could stand on it, that I could manipulate, and I could go down like about five pounds by standing in this really unique way on the scale. And then I felt better about myself, even though I knew I was a total manipulation of the scale, right? Which is weird that I would 
feel then better about myself because it wasn't the truth. And then, horror of horrors, my wife bought a digital scale. <laughs> the thing is completely accurate. I can't, I've tried. I move around on that thing. Boom, right there, the truth. And it just, right? That's what scales do. They tell you the truth, and you can't manipulate it. It's not up for debate. It's not whatever's true for you is true for you. That's me on my scale like this. It's the truth, and the truth is what it is. And sometimes we don't want to know the truth. And the scale says there's truth, and you are subject to it. The second thing the scale says is justice. Now, what's justice? Justice is everything right. Everything, uh, what right? Everything being right, the way God intended it to be. That's justice in the Bible. That this idea of um, human flourishing and thriving and, and people living the lives they were created to live. That's justice in God's mind. So whenever something is out of balance, the call is for justice, to make it right. And God promises that he will do that. That that's actually what he's up to. In the course of history, God is going to make everything right. At the end of the Bible, the next to the last chapter of the book of Revelation, almost all the way at the end, we read a description of how this is going to look at the end of time. It says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. He will, they will be his people, and God himself will be there with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now, that's what God says the final score is. Hmm? If the home team is losing right now, God says you should act according to this because you know that this is what's coming. Now, I want you to make sure you understand and you see that it's not the removal of everything in our world. It's not that we become some kind of great spirit and float around. That's not what God has in store for his creation. What he has in store is the redemption of it. And that's what he invites us to participate in. God says, your job is not to condemn the culture or adopt the culture. It's to be a part of my redemption of it. So are there relationships forever in eternity? You bet you. They just have the right place. Is there gold and silver in eternity? Yep. They just don't capture your heart. They're just used to glorify God. Is there worship? Is there religion? Yeah, but rightly understood. See, it's not that things are done away with in our culture. It's that they're redeemed, and they're given their proper place, and there's justice. There's no more tears. There, there, there's no more mourning. There's no more death. And I'm telling you, Jesus, let's fast forward to the method that Jesus gives. Jesus could not be any clearer at the method that he envisioned the church using. From the very beginning of his ministry, at the very outset, he was so clear about this. I'll read you one verse from Luke chapter 4. Jesus, at the beginning, to proclaim that his ministry was starting, he went into a temple. He um, got the scroll from Isaiah. He unrolled it to this place, and this is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, verse 18 of Luke 4. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free. Jesus says, you want to know what the writing on the wall is for our culture? It's that. It, it, if you want to be a sign, if you want to look for a sign that the kingdom of God is here, is established, and will not fail, then be a part of that, Jesus says. Be a part of of removing oppression. Be a, be a part of bringing good news to the poor. 
Being a part of making justice happen. Tip the scales. Tip the scales. And so we're invited to participate in that. At one point in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus, the only place he ever used this phrase, talked about the finger of God. What do you think he was thinking about? Daniel. And, and he used it to talk about freeing people from oppression that they were facing. So, you want to be a part of what God's doing? It's very simple. We don't point a finger. We, we bring the hands and feet of Jesus in a way that says there is another kingdom that's here. And you can't stop it. I can't stop it. But you can be a part of it. And that's what God invites us to do. All right, let's get real personal. So what does that mean for you? What, what, what are you called to do? Well, you might have noticed this, that in the month of November, we're trying to be extremely practical around here and giving you opportunities for justice and mercy activities. And so many, many of you brought a bike today. And there's you know, hundreds of bikes out there. Tim Adams' face is all red. He's out there in the cold. And uh, why? Because we're going to send those to a place where they can be used for justice, to tip the scales, to give hope, to provide an opportunity, to, for life to be the way God intended it to be, with freedom and hope. And, and later on this week, this Saturday, our Do Something Saturday for the month of November, you could join us down at Crossroads Restoration, and you could be a part of putting a place there and, and fixing it up and, and making it uh, spiffy so that when we uh, try to reach that community that surrounds that campus, they will come and look at something that represents our king. You could do that. You could be a part of that. We're collecting um, long underwear and uh, gloves and hats for the cold weather shelter. You could stop and, and be a part of that. Or maybe it's something completely different. In your life where there's an injustice and you can be a part of making it right. I don't know. But here's what I know. is Our attempt to live as godly people in an ungodly culture has to include acts of justice and mercy. That's what God has displayed to us. So I invite you to be a part of that. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here. And I'm going to challenge you here at the end. Um, as we close for the last few minutes in this service, why don't you do a little personal assessment? Why don't you have God investigate your heart? Why don't you say, God, I'm not sure that my heart breaks for the things that break yours. And I'm not even sure I'm open to that, but I think I want to want that. Start with my heart, God. Uh, maybe you would say, guys, God, give me eyes to see the way you see. I want to see the world the way you see the world. Let me start there. Maybe God will do something in your heart, in your life, right here this morning. Let's pray. Father, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the pattern that you have given us for how to impact our culture. I pray you'd start with my heart. Give me the humility and the hope that Daniel had, and God, help us as a community to live out justice and mercy in the way that is a, a telltale sign that your kingdom is present. I, I thank you for inviting us to be a part of it. I pray you'd give us the strength and courage to join you in it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stay seated just for the first verse or so. Maybe just spend some time with the Lord as we sing this great hymn, Be Thou My Vision.